Welcome to the Grace Hour. We're happy to have you here this morning, and we are very excited to introduce this topic of eternal security. Uh, I'll be talking about that today and for the whole entire week. So my name is Pastor Dennis, and I am the pastor in Frederick, Maryland. And we're just excited to be here and discuss this uh, topic with you today. And again, we'll be doing this for the entire week. So we really want to build a foundation of what your salvation is. And that not only can you be secure in your salvation, but you can also have the assurance of your salvation. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, so please just uh, be with us, enjoy this time, and dig in with us and enjoy this. And put on your thinking caps because we're going to discuss some fun things today. So we want to talk about like what is eternal security. So first thing that we have to do is really define what that means and kind of talk about the terms that are around this because eternal security really comes from not only um, like a doctrinal statement, but really our theology of who God is. So how we think about God can also interpret how our salvation is and how our eternal security is. So we have to be really careful how we define eternal security. So I want to define it this way, and I'm just going to read it. It's, it is the assurance, it is the security and the future assurance that the believer has of salvation, but also his sonship. You know, so there's two things that are happening. Not only that his salvation is secure and that he has assurance of his salvation, but also that his inheritance is as a daughter, as a son of God, that also is secure. Like those two things cannot be taken away. And that's what eternal security deals with. So when you start to study this topic, uh, you're going to find several different words that are going to be used, you know, um, by different groups of believers trying to define eternal security. And th this is like amazing because this again goes back to your theological stance, how you think about God, is interpreting how you think about your security of salvation. And, you know, there are people that might not believe in this. They're going to have a hard time with this discussion. And I ask you really to hold in, listen to our, our discussion and our arguments, and really, really understand that we're not putting this really on an emotional kind of basis, saying that God is a God of love and I need this so that way I can do what I want to do. But understand that this topic really comes from a solid foundation from the Bible. Okay? So we're not just like taking this and making some emotional decision on how my salvation is. But this is a really a biblical theology, a biblical doctrine that God is teaching us about our salvation. And once this is established in my life, what it can produce you know, and one of those terms that is being thrown around there, um, it is the perseverance. You know, so this is like kind of like a more of a Calvinistic point of view about eternal security, meaning that if I am elect by God, I am going to persevere. And that through my perseverance, that is a definition that I am actually saved. So if I'm not able to persevere, then the question is, is am I actually saved? Now, this is all kind of general terms, and if this is something you believe, you know, you can't get too angry about it because we're not diving deep into that topic. But we're kind of focusing in on that word persevere, that I myself will not die in sin, okay? That's what that word perseverance means. Now, I honestly, like what we believe, uh, it looks like you could think about Psalm chapter 16, verse 1, where David himself is saying, preserve me, O Lord. So he says this, like, I can persevere. And the reason why that I could persevere is because it is God himself that is, you know, you know, that he is in the process of sustaining me in my walk with him. You know, he is preserving me, so therefore I am able to persevere. You know, that is kind of what we think about perseverance. Another word that is used, and we're using that word, is eternal security. Uh, these next two words are actually words that we use a lot. Eternal security, the next one would be once saved, always saved. 
you know, both of those definitions or terms that are being used for eternal security, it doesn't really need a lot of definition because they say what they mean or they mean what they say. So we don't really have to dig in deep into it. But eternal security, uh, we would look at that in a theological stance. We would say that it is more of a moderate Calvinist point of view. Um, you know, so what do we mean by moderate Calvinist? Well, it is somebody who, you know, takes maybe three, two or three of the points of Calvinism and they believe those. You know, so you could take the, uh, the, the tulip and describe each one of those. Um, I believe it is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. So that's kind of what a Calvinist would believe. Somebody who is a moderate Calvinist, some would say would believe in, you know, as few as one of those. And I would say, you know, without going too deep uh, into it, that we would believe in most of these, but with a little bit of a twist, you know, and the big one we would say is the P, the perseverance of the saints. And this, we would say that no saints will ever be lost. That's where this term once saves, always saves comes from. That we could say with confidence, you know, from our Bible, and also, you know, we could say with assurance and you know, that word assurance is dealing with the subjective feeling that I have in my life. That I could have an assurance in my life through the objective word of God that even if there is a sin in my life, that I am not, like, completely lost. Okay? So that was what we mean by moderate Calvinism. So, you know, eternal security, once saved, always saved. And this last word that is being used a lot nowadays is this word, assurance of salvation. You know, as a believer, do I have assurance that I am saved? You know, so these four words are terms that are all being used to say this one thing. You know, that I am a child of God. It is Christ who saved me. And it is Christ who has given me an inheritance. And that cannot be taken away. Okay. That is like the thesis, that is our statement that we are saying right now, and we can back these ideas up biblically through and also theologically. We could use the written word of God, and we can also use God himself and what he says in the written word of God, his character, to back up these points of views. And this whole week, we are going to be discussing you know, this topic of eternal security. So we're just going to open it up here. So the first thing that we have to understand is that there is a difference between me being having eternal security and me being assured of my eternal security. You know, I believe that there are a lot of people, and we could define them as believers, but they aren't assured of their salvation because of their experience. Their experience maybe is very far from God. Uh, they could be saved, but maybe there are areas in their life that they are living in a little bit of darkness. There is something that they wish uh, was better um, in their walk with God, and they would say, well, I am not sure that I am saved. That is assurance. That is not eternal security. So a lot of people are eternally secure, but they are not assured. So assurance has everything to do with my... Um, personal experience in my feelings. So as a believer, we are going to walk through some of these objective truths and through the objective truths of the written word of God and the person of God that we could actually have assurance of salvation. And that once I am assured of my salvation, how much freedom there really is. Okay. So we'll kind of go back to that idea of assurance towards the end of our discussion here. But really, again, let's talk about these two gifts that God has given us. Number one, God has given us salvation. Number two, God has given us a gift of an inheritance. Okay? So let's turn to some Bible verses here. I love um, 
We just love this. Let's turn to Romans chapter 11. And again, we're going to use the Bible as the context for this uh, doctrine, the way that God thinks about our salvation. Because if we believe that the Bible says what it, you know, means what it says, then we, then we can have the assurance. Then there's also an argument that could be based versus very simply my wishy-washy cultural or my um, own wishy-washy feeling. So Romans... Chapter 11 says this. This is beautiful. It says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I love that in the New King James. Uh, the King James, I believe, says that they are, he is, they are without repentance, like he can't take them back. But the New King James says, says that they are irrevocable, meaning like what God gives and how God calls they cannot be reversed, okay? They cannot be reversed. You know, if you are to give a gift and then take it back, you know, they call you something, <laughs> you know, and it could be reversed. Like, give that back to me. I know you you don't take care of it. I want it back. Or you don't like it. I want it back. But the fact is, is that my salvation is something that is irrevocable. Now, that is one, one verse that is saying that my salvation cannot be reversed. You know, when we begin to dive into this, I mean, we could sit here, you know, for hours and go through verse after verse after verse and say that God has given us salvation and it cannot be taken away. Okay. And another, another thing that we want to say, too, about our salvation is the reason why that it cannot be taken away or the reason why it cannot be reversed is because of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. This verse says, By grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, stop right there. How has this gift been attained? It's been attained by the grace of God through your faith. So, you know, this, this again is a part of, you know, um, being a moderate Calvinist. Do we believe in unconditional uh, election? We would say, yes, there is no condition for my election in the eyes of God. But in the eyes of man, there is one condition, and that one condition is, is that, that I apply my faith towards him. So right there it says, Ephesians 2, verse 8, that for by the grace you have been saved— through faith. Now, now let's continue this verse. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So here it says that there is a condition of my salvation, and the condition is, is that my it is my faith. And then right after, in the very next verse, he says that it is not of your works. All right, so if, if my salvation could be reversed, then what would the condition of the reversal of my salvation be? It would be, re, it would, the condition of the reversal would have to be, you know, my works. Because we've already established the fact that it cannot change in the eyes of God. You know, it is irreversible. Ro, you know, Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, it cannot be reversed in, 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 by God. He has given something. And I find that in my daily conversations with people, most people will not argue the fact that the condition of salvation is the heart of God. They say God is a good God. He is giving us salvation. The problem with salvation is the heart of man or the action of man. That is where people begin to have a problem with eternal security because they see the action of man and they say, well, if this person is saved, then how could he do such and such? But the beauty of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, is that, you know, Paul is saying that the focus of salvation isn't, the, the, isn't mankind. The focus of salvation is the goodness of God. Because if the focus, of, if the focus was of man then it would go down to my works. And there would have to be elements of my obedience, and those elements of obedience 
would reflect in the fact that, you know, I am saved. So, salvation cannot be gained or lost by my works. I mean, so we could say that eternal security isn't based on what I do or what I do not do. It is based on the goodness of God. You know, and then we could say, and we see it actually back in Romans eleven twenty nine. The second thing, you know, the last thing we want to talk about, the gift of salvation, is that it is an unconditional promise. I mean, we could go through many different verses, and we could talk about the promises of God and how they are unconditional. You know, and this is something that I believe that there are not very many people that would argue that salvation is a conditional promise. So if we're not going to argue that salvation is a conditional promise, then how could we argue the fact that it could be taken away or that it could be reversed or that I could earn it? You know, so salvation is a gift of God, okay? It can't be reversed. It is unconditional, and it is not based or lost, or, or it is not gained through my good deeds. You know, and I mean, and just think about that last point. You know, if it could be gained or lost by my good deeds, this is like something that kind of irks me. Because the fact that, you know, that it could be gained or lost based on my good deeds means that there are many people who have an advantage of salvation over me. Because their, their advantage could be that they have more money. So therefore, they have the, the availability, the, 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 the means to do more good is at their disposal versus me who is so poor and can barely, barely put food on my, on my table, right? Like I don't have the ability to do these things, so therefore I have a smaller chance to be saved because of the availability that is before me. No, God has put this idea of, of eternal security on an even plane before everybody, you know. So if it could be lost or gained, that that would mean that other people have, a, a, you know, an upper hand over me. But God says no, because it is free for everybody. Isn't that amazing? So the the, the second thing that we could talk about the gift is the gift of our inheritance. You know. So let's think about this: that once we get saved, the Bible says that we have received an inheritance. Let's turn to some of these um, uh, verses, actually. Um, yeah, let's uh, maybe, since we're in Romans, let's, let's kind of stay there. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 3. Now, I want you to also remember the context of who, you know, Paul is writing to in all of these epistles that he is writing he is writing to non-Jewish believers. Some of them are Jewish, but in both cases, they are having to be stripped of their um, of of their cultural inferences. Like they they come to God, and everybody has a culture. The Jews came with a culture, and it was a godly culture. So there was some connections that they were able to make. But the Greeks, the Gentiles, they came. To, they came to Christ, and they came with all this baggage, and Paul is having to strip them. Now, could you imagine, you know, believing in all these false gods and then hearing about this God? And you believe immediately. You believe. But think about the baggage that is there, you know, and, and, and the way, the, the inroads of your mind going back and forth. You know, that is there. So Paul is having to establish them that not only are they saved despite maybe the flare-ups of their culture, because maybe some of their religious inferences come back in their daily life. But he also has to build a foundation that they have an inheritance which is going to enable them to live out their salvation. Okay, so Romans chapter chapter 3. I love these verses. Um, what verses are we talking about? Verses 21 through 26. It says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, the demonstration, his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in, in Jesus Christ. Now, you know, to take those many, that many verses in the book of Romans is like a big bite, right? <laughs> That's a lot to chew on. But really here, what is happening here is that, is that, the, uh, that Paul is solidifying the first three things we've already ta talked about in, about salvation. But now he's also introducing this idea that we have an inheritance. It says, um, yeah, that we have redemption 24, that we have redemption, verse 25, he has set forth, you know, all these things. He is dealing with this idea, and we could say this sometime, like, I can make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth, meaning, like, I just barely made it. Like, And what that is saying is, like, I am saved, but maybe that is all I am, and I have no inheritance once I get into heaven. You know, yes, there is something to be said about maybe the loss of rewards or not, the, or maybe not gaining certain things in, in, in heaven, in your soul body. There is something that could be said there. But really, what Paul is saying here is that once we get into heaven, there are some unconditional promises, and God calls those that they are our inheritance, and they can never be taken away. That is also a gift, Okay. We see those kind of things in the parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Okay? All these things were lost and they were they were, they were gained again, right? So that we could make that um, idea like that is kind of like our salvation. We could be lost and now we are saved. And maybe we have wandered, but we are saved. But the prodigal son, right, the lost son, uh, he he wasted his inheritance. He abused his inheritance. Uh, he treated it like trash. Yet when he was you know back with the father, he also gained something else, and it was because he was still a son. So those are some things that we want to talk about, because in our our doctrine, in our theology of eternal security, not only are you saved and always saved. But also there are some things that are in your life that God has given you and they can't be taken away. Okay, so we just read those verses in, in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through 26. And the first gift, uh, being a son of God, being a child of God, a part of that inheritance is that we are justified freely. Okay, we are justified freely. And the emphasis here is not necessarily my condition of being justified, but the fact that it is God who is the one who does the justifying. That's what it says there, that he, that God is the justifier, not me. Okay? So it is God that does the justifying. We also see, and we could read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and verse 29, it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Right there again, he is making that connection that you are eternally saved and that you have an eternal inheritance. And right here he is saying that you are eternally a child of God that cannot be taken away. And the next one, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. This is amazing. You know, this means the gifts, the inheritance of the Holy Spirit, the promise, the comforter that comes into our life. Verse 22, it says, 
we have been sealed. We has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Meaning that the Holy Spirit has been sealed into our hearts and the fact that the Holy Spirit is in our hearts is the guarantee of our salvation. It goes all the way back to the idea the the guarantee of our salvation isn't the th- that we're doing good things or that we're doing bad things and therefore the guarantee is being taken away or it is being given back again. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that the fact that the Spirit of God has been given to you, and that is the guarantee. So what does eternal security mean? Eternal security is not only the theological, the, uh, the objective assurance, but it is also the subjective assurance that I am saved and I have an inheritance with God. That's what eternal security is. And we see that salvation and my inheritance are both gifts of God. They're irrevocable and they cannot be earned or discredited in my life. And see, when I begin to live this way and I have that assurance, I have that subjective Uh, understanding of an objective truth that the Bible says that I am saved and I'm always going to be saved, when I have that assurance, what it does to me in my life is that it takes me and it gives me the freedom to be what God has created me to be. You know, have you ever been, you know, you've been nervous about making a mistake? And almost every single time when you're nervous about making a mistake, you make that mistake. We all have done it a hundred times. You're at somebody's house and they're they're watching you like a hawk and seeing if you're going to mess up. And then what happens? You mess up several times. When if they weren't looking, you do an excellent job. You execute the, the task that you were given to do. But when you are being observed and you feel the stress that there is this uh that there is this authoritarian power that is looking down and judging me. It puts a pressure in my life. And you know what? God is not an authoritarian power who is standing up there and judging me to see if I am worthy of this walk. He has judged it once and for all at the cross, which is a whole nother topic. Salvation was something that is received and it is done at one point in time in your life. It is not something that is done multiple times and that needs to be repeated. It happens once in your life. And there is Greek, you know, uh, context there for that, you know, idea. You know, so so God is not an authoritarian ruler standing over me and pointing his finger saying, you better do good. And if you don't, out you go. No, I have that assurance that it was already taken care of at the cross, once and for all. And it is not by works of righteousness, but by his grace alone, that I have received this gift. So now I have the freedom to be who, all who that I am meant to be in, in, the, in how God has created me to be. And that includes the mistakes, because I could make a mistake and then I rebound. And I know that there is not a severe punishment coming. And you know what? If I could ever think about serving God long term, it is because of this assurance that I have that I am always saved. Because if I'm not assured that I could follow God and then stop and then scratch my head and see my failure and say, God, I am not worthy. And then I walk away because of frustration. But I see many biblical examples of men and women of God. I've seen it practically in my own life. People who have served God and they have made mistakes and but they they rebounded and they continued and they are they are gloriously saved and they are like shining beacons of the grace of God and what salvation really is. And they are assured and they could say without a doubt today that I will be in heaven with my Savior, because of what Christ has done on the cross. Amen. So thank you for joining us today and talking about eternal security. I hope this begins to provoke you 
this does not answer all your questions. Maybe the rest of the week some of your questions will be answered. But understand that salvation, eternal security, is something that is based on the Bible. It is not an emotional response to my insufficiency, but it is a biblical response to God's, you know, omnipotence. Amen. So please join us again for the rest of the week. Continue to enjoy, uh, enjoy us for the rest of the week. And amen. God bless.